Summer reading is in full swing. Visit summerreading.queenslibrary.org for our full summer reading program schedule, book list for all ages, and other resources to keep your kids engaged and learning all summer long. Plus, don't forget to participate in our reading challenge and social media sweepstakes for a chance to win some cool prizes. Queen's Public Library, along with the New York City Department of Education, will be providing free lunches for all children under 18 throughout the summertime. Summer meals will be offered Monday to Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. through August 31st. Enrollment is not required and there is no cost. For more information and a list of participating libraries, visit queenslibrary.org. Back to School is around the corner. Visit queenslibrary.org to see all of our back to school programs and giveaways and to read our guide with helpful tips on family communication, book lists, and more. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's Talk with Diana Getch, author of This Body I Wore, a memoir. Publishers Weekly declares Getch fashions a brilliant and tapestried story of her late in life gender transition, balancing profound personal revelations with cogent analysis of cultural gender narratives. She constructs a gorgeous self-portrait that defies categorization. The result obliterates binary confines around gender with breathtaking finesse. The Chicago Tribune states, rarely does a book arrive so on time Blowing Out the Noise, a hilarious personal history of the full life as a trans woman. It's never pedantic or even inspirational, which is exactly why it is. The New York Times writes, achingly beautiful, Getch has a poetic sensibility that illuminates without simplifying. This body I wore tenderly sketches out a history of the budding trans communities that developed in the late 20th century. Here's an excavated history that endures in the only way it could, in the fleeting memories of those who survived, who endured and who now, like Etch, thrive. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pank, Huffington Post, and have recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions' Penguin Random House, which will be released this winter. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement, my first novel, The Unmentionable Mom, was published in 2015 by Karen Press. And my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marie Media in 2011. It is now streaming on Plex and Tubi and soon on Amazon. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, will be released in spring 2023 by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its ninth year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talents to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Diana Getch is an American poet and essayist. Her poems have appeared widely in The New Yorker, Poetry, The Gettysburg Review, Plowshares, The Best American Poetry, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology, and in the collections Nameless Boy and In America, among others. She also wrote the Life and Transition blog at The American Scholar. Her honors include fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the New School, where she served as the Grace Paley Teaching Fellow. For 21 years, Getch was a New York City public school teacher at Stuyvesant High School and at Passages Academy in the Bronx, where she ran a creative writing program for incarcerated teens. Diana, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and congratulations on your memoir being the New York Library Book of the Day last Friday, August 19th. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm very proud of my own city's library. It's fantastic. Yeah, and thank you for that introduction. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Uh, and I have to tell you very, very quickly as well, um, I too was a teacher in New York for 12 years, but we'll talk about that later. Nice. Um, 
Before we get into our interview, I'd like to read a note about language which opens your memoir. Mm -hmm. This memoir spans several decades, during which trans people in the United States refer to themselves in various and changing ways. To take one example, in the 1980s, the terms crossdresser and transvestite were practically interchangeable. Today, the latter term is generally frowned on, while the former is still accepted. Likewise, some of today's conventions are bound to become problematic for future readers. In this book, I sought to use terminology authentic to the era of each experience. As I and others around me tried to make sense of our identities, language was part of what shaped our reality. We misgendered and deadnamed ourselves left and right, in part because words like misgender and deadname had yet to come into use. By the same token, words matter, pronouns matter, misgendering matters. And for those of you who are aided by trigger notices, this is to respectfully advise you. I thought that that was really uh, potent and, and, and wise and, um, and thoughtful to, to open your memoir that way. Mm. Early on in 1987, you discuss your fascination with women, with them as, quote, citizens of a better world. Please say more about that. Well, you know, um, maybe something common to all trans people is uh, a kind of an irreducible um, uh, admiration, you know, for what you think at one point is the opposite gender. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the natural human envy to the nth power. I heard someone say recently that with envy, it's your insides resembling their outside. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah, but the thing with, with you know, when you look at gender and gender expression, very often that outside, you know, if you're trans also is congruent to something in their core or your core. Mm. Um, and uh, it's just a longing. Um, you know, you see it on the outside and you don't know it's you hmm. or you don't know it's your gender. And so, you know, you're longing for yourself. Sure. Wow, that's beautiful. And I didn't want to start with the obvious question. That's why I started with this, this, one, this question. It's a little bit more niche. So I will now go to the obvious question. Uh, how difficult was it for you and how long did it take to be able to put down on paper and into this beautiful book, this body I wore, uh, your journey. Can you talk, talk us through that process? Okay, so what did it take to write this and how long and you know what told me? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I was a poet forever. You know, I put out eight collections of poetry, books, chapbooks, et cetera, and um, and I now think that the reason why I was doing, part of the reason why I was a poet and not doing a lot of prose writing, certainly not long prose, is because it required an honesty mm. um, that I was simply not capable of, even if it were fiction. Um, That's interesting. You think prose writing required more honesty than, than poetry? Well, yeah, in a sense, because there's um, poetry, you know, you're expected to write through a filter of one kind for another or another. And if you don't, you're often criticized as just being flat yeah. or, or, you know, the difference between TMI and a confessional poem that maybe liberates others, that elevates a conversation is the quality of the filter you can bring to it. You can, you know, in poetry, it's like you're, you're flashing something from one side of a screen and the audience looks at it from the other side of the screen. Yeah. And there's this kind of tacit agreement that if they like the screen, that's all that counts. Yeah. And they don't see you. And I've compared this to, um, you know, what Cole Porter did with song. Mm -hmm. You know, here's this gay man writing the, the straight heterosexual American songbook of love. Yeah. You know, yeah. The songs had... You know, I don't know if I could call it depth, but they did have a quality to them, for sure, you know, a, a refinement to them. You know, and, and all these straight old couples saying, you know, honey, they're playing our song. Um, <laughs> There's so something it, sort of beautifully subversive on some level as a gay man that I identify with. Cole Porter did sneaking that in, 
and you know it, it becomes heteronormatized on some level by the straight listening public but yet he was deeply satisfied by being able to express his heart yeah absolutely yeah. and you know the long time affinity for you know the gay culture in broadway is really that that kind of filter raised to, to you know to that to that power and you know now it's just the source of camp and so forth and yeah. kind of like the jig is up yeah you yeah. know broadway has come out yeah <laughs> Um, so for me, you know, I think thing one was the ability to come out, um, you know, to have any chance of being able to write this thing. Um, so, so, you know, in a way, it, it, the journey was sort of together with, with my life mm -hmm. in, in that way. And that, then I had to figure out, okay, you know, to me, this is a task of saying the unsayable. Mm. You know, I mean, that note you read about language points to how we had no language, yeah. you know, for much of my life. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, good. Any poet would love this assignment. <laughs> you yes. Know, say the unsayable, because yeah. to impose today's language onto it, it it's cheating. Yeah. And it's also cheating the reader of the full embodiment and power of what that meant. You know, not I, to to know yourself. I think that's a really rich idea. And, and, it, and it's definitely something that is intensely literary and intensely also philosophical. And I think the two are so intermingled. You also write about how you thought you might be gay. You dated women for a time as well. And then you found you were not attracted to men, but to women and specifically to femininity. And I think this kind of harkens to the question that I asked you just a minute ago. Can you, can you correlate those two and, and expound a little bit more on that insight? Well, I never dated men. Um, I, it was one time that there's a chapter, the first chapter actually, where I, I, in college, I was so unhappy. I said, well, almost philosophically, almost intellectually, well, maybe I'm gay because nothing right. else is, you know, like deduction or something. Right. So I said, okay, if I was gay, who, who would it be? <laughs> <laughs> so I was gay in the conditional for one night and then, and then my date said, you're not gay. <laughs> right. I remember that. It was great. It was a great kind of really cute comedic moment. It was a moment. And, and I, I said to him, I said, well, if I were, it, it would be you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what can I offer? This yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in terms of the attraction uh, to women, yeah, it's, it's, it's really complicated. Um, you know, uh, because I don't even have the category of lesbian available to me. Right. You know, if I did, it wouldn't be so complicated at all. Sure. But I think that's what's so beautiful about your memoir too, is like, okay, so this is not, yeah, you know, the culture might want boxes, but there aren't. And I think that's okay. And it has to be okay. And um, there's something very warm and reassuring about that, how, how you're able to use language to shape reality. To, to shape your own reality as you need it to be. And I think that's something that is applicable for so many people in so many communities. And I'm, we're gonna to touch on that in a moment later. Um, but I also wanted to ask you about when you went to graduate school at NYU and you began exploring the New York nightlife and especially the transvestite community as an yeah. admirer, I thought that was interesting. I think that was the word you used or the sentiment you expressed as an admirer. Well, that was the technical term. Yeah. <laughs> lingo you'd see these ads in the village voice and in other places for you know tv ts and admirer transvestite this transvestite. is the 80s right diana the 80s so that was a polite word for chasers mm -hmm. and it, it might have even been on the cusp of that word chaser becoming popularly known right. um you know and chaser is short for quote unquote tranny chaser i mean this is just the lingo of the time right and um, so, yeah, I went as an admirer um, because I certainly identified as an admirer or an envier or a desirer. But, you know, a lot of the people I met who were uh, some version of transgender, you know, especially folks who were looking for dates or looking for tricks, mm -hmm. you know, they wanted me to be a chaser. They wanted me to be a customer. Mm -hmm. So you know, and I just said, I'm not, that's not what I was there for. Um, 
you know, I just was getting a contact high from being around these people. And I, I needed to explore femininity on some level in some way. And this was my, my research, my nightlife, um, you know, just. And it was mostly the fur factory and the limelight, I think were some of the, the nightclubs that you mentioned that you had gone to in the eighties. Well, the, the limelight uh, came a little later in the sense of it being a more mainstream place. Right, right. You know? And then it became, it was the church that became the club, that became the mall, that became the gym, that I don't know what it is right now. <laughs> right now, I think they, it's, a, it's like a, a mall with a lot of little yeah. stores, one of which sells a variety of Spanish ham. It's so, so it's surreal. It's a pound or something. <laughs> oh, my God. But yeah, it was a deconsecrated Episcopal right. church from the 19th century. And, and I think part of why it was, um, who was that guy on Saturday Night Live who's at the hot, New York's hottest club? Who is? Oh, that's, um, I know you're talking about, uh, Bill Hader? Was it Bill yeah, Hader? I, I don't remember the character's name, though, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. so, you know, that was New York's hottest club at one point. Yeah. And I think yeah. part of what made it hot for people is, you know, it happened in a church and there's all sorts of sinning and, you know, uh, bacchanalia going on at the limelight. Um, but the, if, if you wanted me to run down some of those clubs, I mean, there's a lot of older trans people, people who were cross-dressing at the time, people who were, you know, really all over the spectrum right. that kind of visit Facebook and talk to each other in terms of nostalgia about what these places were and the old Edelweiss Club, which was a you know, dangerous, cutthroat, filthy, unsanitary uh, kind of prostitution and drug spot on 11th Avenue has now been converted in our memories into those were the days. Mm, yeah. um, and, and you know, I pass by that block because I do a lot of walking and I just look at these newfangled towers that are built over it, and it was better back then. I know, I know. I, I, I was. Um, I mean, I'm 45 now, but I was like a teenager, and very young in the late 80s into the early 90s. And I remember. I'm, I'm old enough to remember what it was before the last 20 years since 9/11, and how New York has become Disneyfied uh, and blandified, right. if you will. Tell us about your experience as a teacher at Stuyvesant. And for those of you who don't know, Stuyvesant is one of the most competitive public high schools in the country, certainly in New York. And I think you write that the admissions rates were higher into Harvard than they were into Stuyvesant. Easily. <laughs> yeah. I mean, take a look at because in 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 colleges they want to you know advertise how selective they are, number of people applied, number of people accepted. I mean, I used to proctor the, the selective high school exam. They just called it the Stuyvesant exam because the other two schools, you know, got second pick and third pick and what have you. Um, everyone's trying to get into Stuyvesant High School. And, you know, there'd be 35 people in a room for this, sitting for this exam in the spring. There'd be one that would get in just yeah. by the odds. Very competitive. Extremely competitive. And, you know, um, the exam is, is more cumbersome than difficult, but still you had to get 100 or you had to get, you, there's very room, little room for error because you're being compared to each other. Sure. What exam wouldn't be hard, you know, in that sense. And it, it was successful at bringing a lot of brain power in front of you as a teacher. And these kids were in these chairs and the principal said, you know, to the new teachers one time, if you're wondering if they're going to be smarter than you, they are. They are. <laughs> they are. You, know? you were a teacher, though, at Stuyvesant pre, before your trans transition, right? And you wrote about in your memoir going out for drinks a couple of blocks away or right down the block with some of your colleagues and then eventually coming out to them. Can you talk about that experience a bit? Um, yeah, there's a scene. So there's a chapter called Stuyvesant. Mm -hmm. And I put the chapter, you know, in there and I named it Stuyvesant. I wanted to just bring out how trans people are fully woven, especially closeted trans people at the time, fully woven into the fabric of society, into every institution you can think of. I mean, it's, it's a little like the idea behind The Wire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The major institutions of a city. Yes. 
you know, and how it's laced with, you know, drugs, corruption and so forth. You know, let's show the major institutions in any city. I mean, it's a love letter to New York. And there I am in the middle of the dance world, um, you know, shooting pool and pool halls, you know, befriending yeah. people, doing all these things and teaching at New York City's number one science high school. Right. And um, and it also represents the things you lose if you do come out. You know, I mean, you know, that, that's that's the question at the heart of this book is, you know, when people say, you know, what took you so long, which is an almost shaming question. Yeah. Yeah. But if people stick around for the answer and they're not there to shame, this book is here to say, you know, you can't afford to see yourself as trans, you know, at this time, if you can possibly help it. Now, there are people who couldn't get away with not seeing themselves. They're, the early transitioners had no way of concealing from themselves or others the fact that they were trans. Late transitioners, as I write, have no way to unearth it. Yeah, That's so, very, it was very poignant. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Dan. Well, there you are in the middle of life. And so I wanted to show, uh, you know, people that, you know, even though it begins sort of in this world that we were just talking about a minute ago, you know, all of these sort of um, seedy, um, speakeasy type, you know, dives, you know, hidden underground alternative, you know, in this, the places that cops would raid, you know, periodically, even though I was there, I was also in the middle of Stuyvesant High School showing up on a Monday morning with lesson plans. And then I was also every Friday, most Fridays for a time doing quote research, mm -hmm. which means martinis. Martini, I, remember, I, I got a chuckle out of that. <laughs> with, with my favorite topics, <laughs> yeah. absolutely brilliant classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. And the three of us would get together and do what teachers did in every school in the city public teachers get together and we do a post-mortem on our week because teaching is incredibly lonely and you've got these two brilliant colleagues and you talk about three different weeks that happen to be the same week in three different schools that happen to be the same school. Mm -hmm. and Oh my God, did we have stories. One, was, one story was better than the next and thank God for these colleagues. And to the point, uh, you mentioned earlier about billiards. It uh, occupied a good deal of your life, uh, and it made you <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it made you miss the presence of women, and maybe uh, even engendered your poetry writing. You, you mentioned in, in the memoir. You describe it as your addiction to cross-dressing was replaced by your addiction to pool, which was replaced by your addiction to poetry. Can you speak a little bit about billiards and the relationship? Well, let's put the next sentence in there. The next yeah. sentence is, that's not quite right. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but it was the story I was telling myself. Right, right. That's what right. it was, yeah, right. And so it was, do you think maybe it was an, it was an example of sort of necessary self-delusion for the sake of what you needed in that moment? And I, yeah, I think, I think I was doing, I was doing a lot of spinning. I was, you know, at the time, you know, maybe I could call it stumbling. I could call it graceless, um, but in hindsight, I was surviving. Yeah. You know, I was just, I mean, again, at the time I was wasting my life. In hindsight, I might have been preserving my life. Mm. I mean, just finding something other than, you know, maybe drugs. Although I know people who credit drugs with saving their life because if they didn't do that heroin, God forbid, they might have driven their car into the Illinois River. I and I have a friend who once said that. Oh wow! Yeah, gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I I think what's so great about Diana's book, I'm talking now to the viewers, is that she and also I'll just speak to you is that you're very even about your treatment of yourself and the culture and the people in your world, the family, friends who inhabited your world. You're you're very uh, fair, you're tough when you need to be tough on yourself and everyone, and you're fair when you need to be fair on yourself and everyone, if I can give a review. I think it's just incredibly, it's an incredibly wise and compassionate, but clear-eyed um, assessment of an experience and a journey. 
Uh, so and it's not an easy thing to do as a writer. And we spoke about, and we're going to get to uh, what we had mentioned the other day during our AV test uh, in a moment. But the advent of the internet changed things for everyone, and especially for you, you wrote. Uh, please tell us about using search engines for the first time and how that opened the world of transgenderism and helped you learn about yourself. Well, you know, I'm not alone in saying this, but the internet changed everything for sure. trans people. And there's a section that comes later after the advent of the internet, you know, which for all intents and purposes was around 1994. Mm -hmm. um, later on, I point out this business of cracking. You know, they, they call a proto trans person, someone who's not out to themselves, but maybe some of us recognize them. Uh, we call them eggs. And once you crack, you can't uncrack. It's like you can't unring the bell, you know, and the internet cracked more of us than maybe everything else combined. Something cracks you. I think that happens on the queer path as well for, for, for sure. anyone, you know, something tells you you're gay, uh, early, late, whatever. And, um, you know, the availability of search engines, the availability to because my search engine previously was New York City. Right, right. And there was a hell of a lot of danger or risk to a job or what have you involved in getting out to these clubs, especially yep. when I was cross-dressing and going to these clubs. And and then I started researching, you know, mainstream clubs and how do I take, you know, a more liberated view of gender expression into a mainstream place? Or is it a fetish or is it not? And, you know, the only research you could do involved cover of night, danger, you know, a cab, public transport, whatever. Well, I mean, picture the difference when now you're in the safety of your home. As I put it in that one chapter called You Are Not Alone, which is it's still up there. That's one of the websites, actually, yeah, that's great. Uh, for transgender people. Um, instead of going out, you were going in mm -hmm. and you're going further into yourself. You have protection and dignity so that you can chat with people like you. You can expose yourself to the fact that this is not just some kind of New York City, you know, only in New York, wild, queer, weirdo thing, but it's everywhere, especially people who don't have access to a New York City. Right. Um, and it just blew our minds. Oh, yeah. Um, and and it, it, it cracked us. It cracked a lot of us. Can you talk to us a little bit about your relationship <clears throat> with your older brother and your mother when you were a child on Long Island um, and what you had discovered about yourself when you were being punished in particular? I thought that was very striking. You spoke about how your, your punishments helped you gain self-awareness uh, as a child. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if, if I wrote that, that they or if I think that they help me with self-awareness, but it, it definitely at a certain, you know, you crack with that as well. Sure. You know, people who are abused as children, just like a lot of trans people, you know, in the closet can't afford up until a certain point to, to know themselves as trans and then something happens and they can't afford not to. I think the same thing happens or a parallel thing happens with something like child abuse, I mean, you can't afford to know that you're abused mm. because you, you depend on these people for your life. Yep. yep. You know, sure. It's really a Stockholm syndrome going on with this epidemic of child abuse. That we have. You were going to say something. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, it's your parents are your first representations of humans, <laughs> typically, right? So how they tend to treat you is how we tend to form um, representations of humanity. And yeah, but then your your brother as well. You had a kind of a complex relationship, right, with him. You write about him. Well, my brother was a bully, yeah. and um, you know, and this was lifelong. And um, and again, you know, who's going to see it? Who's got the guts to see it? And then once you see it, who's got the guts to say it? And then can you afford to see it, et cetera? The whole thing. And again, you know, it's no different with, you know, battered wives who some, sometimes don't see themselves as battered. Mm -hmm. It's probably part of the issue. It, it just becomes normalized. Mm -hmm. 
for survival purposes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book uh, from a British psychologist called Betrayal Theory, mm. you know, pointing this out as well. It's no different from Stockholm Syndrome. Right. You right. know that the people who are betraying you, you can't afford to see it if you're dependent on them. Right. So you make excuses, of course. Yeah, you do that. But I, I just wanted to point out on, on that question that you asked, in terms of self-awareness, once I cracked as an abused kid, once there, there's a situation that happened when I was seven, and looking back, that's pretty young. I, maybe I was very young. Sure. But it was relentless abuse. It was it was unbelievable looking back, actually. Um, I mean, we're talking about imprisonment. I mean, we're talking about New York state laws. Yeah. Um, and uh, once I cracked, um, I realized, you know, number one, how worthless I was to them in their eyes. Mm. You are worthless. That's the message. Um, but number two, I realized that I wasn't them. You know, right, and, right. and at one point I, I said, well, I wrote it because I said it to myself at the time, who the hell are these people? And I don't know what gave me the perspective to step back from these people and see myself as a changeling mm. and the victim of some cosmic bureaucratic error. Yeah. How do you wind up with these people who were essentially elementally different yeah. from me? And I started looking at them as alien. Hmm. And had I not been able to do that, I think I would have identified with my abuse far more than I did already. Um, wow. you know, it's, well, a sad, it's a sad story, but it could have been infinitely sadder. It's it's sad, yes, and it's also uh, I think incredibly incredibly uh, potent and incredibly fascinating too. That the particularly the insight that you had at such a young age to sort of start viewing these abusers the way you did and to, to be able to sort of separate yourself from them defensively. It's kind of very sophisticated for a child. Um, so, you know, and, and I think it, 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 it speaks to like a nascent uh, or, or native um, survival skill and, and was, a toughness, a resilience. Yeah, there was yeah. something in that, you know, so much so that, you know, when I read Huckleberry Finn and I see how he is with his father, you know, I'm, I'm really, I really got my finger on the pulse of that kind of kid. Mm -hmm. You know, on the one hand, he's not ready to fight his dad because he's much weaker. I wasn't ready to, you know, take my family to court or something. I was seven. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you need to believe that these are your people. But there's this other region. And the same with Huck Finn. He knew to run. He knew that this man was not his friend. Right. You know, he wasn't ready to stand up in that other way, but he had enough of an identity to know, get the hell out, get away from Pap. I think he calls him Pap. Also, ironically, that's one of the books I taught um, <laughs> when I taught uh, senior literature at Bronx Prep, uh, Democracy Prep High School, it's a charter school in the South Bronx. Nice. Uh, it was the last book I taught there before I left the school. Um, also, when you were a child, though, you started to notice gender binaries that seemed unfair or nonsensical to you. Can you speak about that? You're a very sophisticated and advanced child, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a late bloomer in a lot of ways. But yeah, it was just the, the stuff that you couldn't help thinking, I guess, yeah. if you were me. I just see these things. You know, one of the things I noticed and we didn't have words like gender binary or what have you. Right. Uh, but I just did notice the extent to which boys and girls were like upside down from one another. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you think of two more different goals in life than on the one hand to want to be strong and on the other hand to want to be pretty? Yeah. <clears throat> How can both of these people, both of these halves of humanity, be the same species <laughs> yeah i mean like like how how they they each have the same set of lungs you know 
what is accounting for this difference? I mean, because it just seemed bizarre. Yeah. And it was bizarre. You know, people who are, you know, against the binary, they point out it's bizarre. You know, why, why are girls this color and boys that color? And then, you know, gender it's expression, clothing. So arbitrary. It's, yeah. It's so, it's so arbitrary. I mean, I'm not ready to abolish the binary. What I'm ready to do is liberate. I'm not ready to abolish gender. I, I think we should liberate gender. Yeah, I like that. I like that. It's one of the most ridiculous slogans. Can you think of a more stupid slogan <laughs> politically than abolish gender? I mean, imagine if the gay community came out with, you know, the slogan abolish sex. Right. It's core to what we are or what we desire or what we. Yeah, I mean, it's about you know, it's, liberating sex. Yeah. Right. It's about liberating. Don't do away with it. Just yeah, free it. I, I, I don't know that this is <laughs> idiocy. <about> yeah. <laughs> it. There's nothing wrong with any of it. Uh, mm. But let's let's open the let's blow the thing open. And uh, I'm actually really that I can get behind. Yeah. What what when I see, you know, men in skirts or rock and heels or men, I love that. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I love men experiencing the freedom. But at the same time, who do you think blew that open? You know, it's it's trans people. You know, it's so the trans community. Yeah, of course. We watched Tim, Timothy Chalamet, you know, be the talk of the Oscars because he wore a jacket, a woman's jacket, to the oh, Oscars. Yeah. Like this big guy. Meanwhile, you know, trans people getting killed. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 there's something really wrong with the culture in the way that it, I don't know, turns a blind eye on one thing while glorifying another. And then simultaneously fetishizing while at the same time uh, dehumanizing. It does so many disturbing, contradictory things, our culture, that it makes my head spin half the time trying to make sense of it. But that well, was a perfect that, example. That was a perfect example. Critical race theory makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah and this is yeah, the real, yeah. this is not the fake critical race theory that not a single Republican in the land actually understands. Yeah. Critical race theory, one of the principles, one of the tenets, let me see if I can get this right is that the only time there will be progress in civil rights is when the dominant group benefits from it. Yeah, wow, wow. it's so, very telling. Yeah. yeah, so Timothy shall, you know, so, so cisgendered men and women have benefited incredibly, yeah. you know, from trans uh, visibility uh, and in many ways far more than trans people, far more safely than trans people. Oh, sure, sure. You know, and this is what happened, uh, you know, as far as affirmative action. It has benefited women. You know, it has benefited people who get into universities by affirmative action legacy. Mm -hmm. That's like rich white people. Yeah. Of course. You know, okay, let's have affirmative action. Uh, you know, far more that it's than it's in and, and with with African-Americans, affirmative action remains a slippery slope in terms of how they get perceived how it's dangerous, how it, I'm not against it, but it's much less dangerous when it comes to these other more dominant groups. That's critical race theory. I think more people would be behind critical race theory if they understood it. I think the problem is that the popular culture is treating it, is doing it a disservice by being glib about how it presents it because obviously popular culture is upheld by the establishment and they don't want people to really get something that can end up doing themselves a disservice. So I think it's all by by clever design, Diane. I agree with you. I wanted to ask you about, let's move up a bit from childhood to high school. You started to talk about a facsimile person um, that you, this, can you tell us about the facsimile person you created in high school? And then also about your yearbook, which you yeah. said is the most painful thing you own. Can I read you the facsimile person? Would yeah, absolutely. Like, please, please do. Let's see if I can locate it real quick. Sure. It's, um, it's in a chapter call, called War is Hell, I believe. Yeah. And it's it's actually the year after high school. I look back and start to um, understand what, what I was doing. Um, uh, it's no wonder I wasn't close to anyone in high school, I knew a lot of people and it felt like I had friends, uh, but how could I possibly share who I was? Instead, I constructed a person for them to know, 
a facsimile composite of male athlete artist scholar for them to either admire or hate, but never know. I cultivated a force field of cryptic speech and a sharp tongue to prevent my peers from seeing through this facsimile person. I confused people. I cut people without warning, surprising even myself. So, yeah, that's the way I kind of voice this, um, you know, this arrangement of personality. Um, I didn't even know what I was, I was doing it. But, you know, nowadays when we see this kind of individual, a lot of trans people, they say that person could be trans yeah. because there is a hole inside of themselves that seems to be so unknowably vast, mm. we start to recognize it as a possible sign. Mm. Um, it's very, uh, the passage and then your explanation were both very uh, eloquent and, and I think revelatory. Um, what is- uh, can, I, can I get to the yearbook issue? Oh yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, please do. All right, so, so the yearbook, you know, the, it's the most painful thing I own because, um, and I actually quote verbatim from, you know, somewhere up on one of these shelves is the year by high school yearbook. Oh my gosh. And I quote what these people are saying about me. And, uh, and it's all this puzzling stuff. And it's kind of sharp as well. You know, in a yearbook is a kind of a sacred space where everyone sort of waxes nostalgic. Yeah. You know, my yearbook. It's like, <laughs> Jeez. maybe they didn't believe I was asking them to sign. I was just not aware. And they just wrote these things. How could this all be the same person? Hmm. And I present all of these things. You know, how could people do this? And, and, and in every single one, it's about, I don't know what the hell your deal is. Mm. I can maybe appreciate, you know, your depth or, but boy, do you confuse me or, you know, et cetera. And, um, and I start to put together that, you know, this arrangement of confusion and of impenetrability was my closet. You know, that was, I mean, I kind of liken it strangely enough to Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. Yeah. Being a high school teacher, I'm sure you know this story. Yeah, of course. So every witness thinks that the, they all, they're they only ear witnesses. So they all they hear is language and they always think it's a different language. So they're in Paris, it's a cosmopolitan hotel. So the Italian witness thinks that it's British but speaks no English. <laughs> You know, the British witness thinks that it is Spanish, but speaks no Spanish. And everyone thinks it's a different language. And then um, Dupin, the, the, the smarter than, you know, everybody, uh, concludes that it can't be a human being. It's the orangutan. Right. It's a, the orangutan because it's making sounds that, you know, the ape can maybe have a voice with similar timbre or pitch or something but can't, uh, the orangutan can't speak any language. Everyone just assumes these screams are in a different language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that orangutan's closet was everybody's confusion. I didn't include that in the book because I don't want to be comparing trans people to animals in the zoo or sure. animals even worse. But, but it's that same kind of thing where, where, you know, again, how do you express without words what this experience is well it was sitting there right in my high school yearbook a wordless expression an embodiment of a closet um because i had never read any satisfactory of account that captures not report but capture you know what it is you know to be a 17 year old trans kid hmm. you know in 1981 what is that I, I think that you captured it uh, vividly and, and, and deeply and in a very, and yeah, and I think, you know, I, I fancy myself well-read and I've never read anything that uh, comes close to what you were able to approximate in, in this memoir. So I think you were successful uh, in, in portraying it 
um, Diana. What has been the greatest surprise to you during this journey? The grief. Can you say more about that? I had no clue as to um, how much grief I was carrying. Wow. I wow. did not know. And, and again, I think this is one of the things you can't afford to see because if you were fully exposed to the um, the tide, of, of, of it would be enormous. In fact, I said to a therapist not long ago, can grief be traumatizing? And she didn't even have to think. She goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Just sure. the sheer volume, you know, anything that's just that overwhelming. And the grief didn't kick in the way it has until I was writing one of the childhood chapters. And wow. once once the floodgates of the grief were open, it just hasn't closed. Um, go what ahead. Year, what year did you start writing this body I wore? I started around, seriously, around 2019. Um, I was toying with some chapters, possible chapters, um, in 2018. But what happened at that point earlier on was I would write a chapter and I'd kind of like it. You know, I'd write the crap out of something, you know, for a few paragraphs. And then a few months later, I'd look at it and I'd say, no, that's not true. Hmm. And it was as if the truth changed. And I, I kind of gave up. I just said, this is never going to sit still. Even if I like what I write, it's just always going to change. And then I reapproached it um, in, in, in 2019 and I started showing it to people. Um, and, and got together, you know, the sample, the proposal and got a deadline and got more serious that way. You write a fair amount about, um, Buddhism. What has Buddhism provided you, especially, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Ngondro? Oh, Nundro. Nundro. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, what is it, you know, and before you answer that, I also yeah. think about when you wrote about while you were on a meditation retreat, your female identity came to you in a vision asking not to be forgotten. Um, I thought that was really incredible and, and deeply moving. Can you just sort of speak generally about w when you came to Buddhism and, and, and what it's provided? So I first came to Buddhism in college, mm -hmm. um, you know, at Wesleyan University in um, 1982. Um, I don't know why I just said that date in Italian to myself, 1982. <laughs> um, and uh, I was taking a class in Zen, it was called Zen Practice and Theory, you know, so they, you know, this very smart Alec a professor wanted to reverse the two as a statement. And I think at the time, the meditation, I found out my bo I had a body that could meditate right away. I just dropped right into space. Hmm. And you know, I'm not sure what it was doing at the time. I, I wasn't meditating in any kind of a refined way. And yet, and yet, there was a kind of a, a sense of openness, um, a sense of relaxation that I needed. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually helping with headaches that I had, chronic headaches. And so it was the embodied side of, of Buddhism. You know, one of the problems with a lot of meditators who never go anywhere is they they wind up sitting they wind up using it as a tool to just cut their head off from their body right, right and for me i was just sinking into the body i knew enough as a young person that you're not going to relieve this pain unless you go into it um you know i'm not going to do the drug thing or the cutoff thing or the exit route it just not gonna i just knew it was a dead end i had to go into the pain which meant going into the body so I was always meditating in, by instinct in a very somatic way. Um, and I kind of just sort of kept that very basic, non-theistic, you know, unrefined practice alive until um, a teacher came along and sort of showed me that what I was doing was kind of the point. Hmm. Although it's ancient, why don't I learn it? Why don't I learn the ancients and why don't I get get more and more refinement and depth and a, and a sense of path? Hmm. You know, with Buddhism, there's always ground path and fruition. They love threes, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, the, the ground is the view, the path is what you do, and the fruition is um, uh, the goal, you know, some kind of liberation. And then when you get up to this Vajrayana level, which is what this chapter is about, is a chapter called In the Cabin of the Crazy One. Mm -hmm. I'm doing tantric or Vajrayana practice. That is known as a fruitional practice, which means that um, the teacher actually shows you at the beginning what this state is. And it's so good that you want to get good at touching into it. Mm. And so it was all a very good way to stay engaged, um, uh, connect with my body, never leave the body, don't hate the body, um, don't locate my spirituality in any other place than the body. It was mm -hmm. straight mainline Walt Whitman. The body is the place of the soul and the only place. That's not a yeah. quote from Whitman, but that's... Oh. But the sentiment, sure. And you also write, you know, in addition to being, can I can I call you a Buddhist? I mean, would you do identify as Buddhist? Yeah. And also a poet. Um, you have this incredible line that speaks to this in your book. Uh, it wasn't until I began the transition that my shame around femininity began to unwind. Women's clothes were now my clothes. When stepping onto a curb, there was a feeling in your haunches that was startlingly feminine and something inside released and you no longer felt like you had to perform femininity or underperform masculinity. And around that time, your voice started to change too when you released fear and tension. I, you know, it would take a poet <laughs> to be able to capture that, that, very, um, that very kind of elliptical, but yet corporeal uh, sensation and idea. And, and I just wanted to read it because I, I thought it was remarkably well done. And, and you really captured something. Uh, if you wanted to speak more to that point, of course, we have some time if you'd like to. Well, you know, the, early on, um, I think it was in one of the childhood chapters, I used that, you know, Joycean word epiphany. Mm -hmm. And I arrived at this formula that I wrote down that, you know, you, you can never understand an epiphany because an epiphany is the thing that understands you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like you that. know, uh, you can't understand gender because gender in a pure sense, I'm talking gender identity, I'm not talking about gender roles, I'm not right. talking about gender expression, but gender identity understands us more than we understand it, far more than we understand it. And all we can do is align ourselves. And, you know, Buddhism did this for me, meditation practice did it for me, but, you know, the same kind of embodiment can happen just in a literal transition where, you know, okay, so you're learning some vocal techniques and I don't hold myself up as some model of some voice, but then again, what voice is perfect and what is a voice? Right. But still, you know, you're training to have, I'm training to have a voice more congruent. So people look at me and they listen to me and they say, okay, I can, I'm not distracted now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm safer and I can get on well. And so you're training these conscious things, you know, the fake it till you make it kind of outer training, um, you know, pitch, prosody, resonance, articulation, but they don't fully take effect until something from inside comes up to, comes up to rises to the bay and I call that a kind of an inner somatic permission mm, like that, that something releases inside that um, can meet what you're doing on the outside. And you can have moments of, 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 of liberation. It's, it's very similar actually to the tantric path now that I think about it. Yeah, I mean, I remember I did a 12 day silent meditation retreat in Vipassana 10 years ago, and we were meditating 10 hours a day, not talking, fasting for 12 days. And, you know, you're sitting in this uh, Aditya pose and you're, you wanna scratch your face, you wanna sneeze, you wanna move because your back is starting to ache. You're getting memories of childhood that are disturbing to you. But your job there, as we were told over and over again, was to just observe. That's it. Just let it come I mean, in. The Zen people, go. they're pretty Spartan about this stuff. They're, <laughs> yeah, those, it was intense. Those, <laughs> those, those <are> really <laughs> um, 
I just want to let everybody know that we'll be taking questions for Diana shortly. So if you'd like to start sending them in, please do so. And while we're waiting, Diana, I still have another question or two of my own. Sure. Um, you and I mentioned earlier this week during our AV test that uh, you feel like you're now possibly stuck in the trans literary ghetto. And since your transition, critics no longer focus on your craft as a poet and as a wordsmith, but rather as your identity. Uh, and of course, this is a situation that is applicable to trans writers and artists, but also black writers and artists and gay writers and artists and female writers and artists. And that- That's right. Can you, what, what, what occurs to you immediately with regard to this conversation that you feel, because you started publishing when you were, before you transitioned. Right. And critics and readers would comment on your language, on your craft, right? And now since this body I wore, uh, which was only published a few months ago, right? Uh, earlier this year, yeah. they've been focusing on your identity. Well, you know, here it is. I mean, this book is a book. Yeah, <laughs> yes. It's a freaking book. <laughs> yeah. It is having a conversation with Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. It's having a conversation with Emerson, who said books are to inspire. And he also said of Montaigne, cut these words and they bleed. Mm. It's a book. It's a book right? And this book was a new arrival from a powerhouse press. This is Forrest Strauss. Yeah. These are the big boys, so to yeah. speak. Yeah, they are. And where do they put it? Not on the new arrivals table. They put it back in the trans queer literary ghetto. Yeah. It's a book, people. Yeah. And, you know, when do we get to have literature? You know, is it soup yet? Now, when I wrote this book, I was very conscious of familiar formulas, stiff conventions. But you know what? Every single genre, subject, and demographic, including white males, have their conventions that need to be um, transcended, mm -hmm. you know, but a trans woman can transcend all of these conventions and write a book that, that when you read it, you're not going to narrow it. I mean, when you read those blurbs, they sounded like five different books. Yeah. Cause that's what literature will do. Yeah. It's a Rorschach. It, it yeah, is. You yeah. yeah. You know, it, it reads like a detective novel. It reads like a poem. It reads like a whole bunch of things. But it's it's not just this informational memoir. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know how to not write literature. Right. And, and that was the joy. So they, they will put you in a shoebox no matter what because <laughs> of you. Know, so in a way, I'm, you know, welcome to most of the human race, you know, for Diana. This is what it's like. It's frustrating because the the emphasis on language and on thought and on expression is so powerful in your writing that it's, I think it's important that we see you as a writer first who is able to craft poetic lyrical sentences with a, with a loaded with incisive uh, insights. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it is literature and it is frustrating that some critics or some booksellers feel the need to, to put such books in boxes. And that's, I mean, that's a, it's a shame. Yeah, I mean, you meet. How do we move past that, right? <laughs> well, with, with these presses, you know, you meet with the publicity team, mm -hmm. and they, you know, you're queen for a day, and they say, okay, how do we sell this book? And I said, well, you have a whole survivor community. Well, mm -hmm. tell us more about that. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, and then you have a Buddhist uh, contingent. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some things I did particularly in that chapter in the cabin of the crazy one. I mean, I'll just give a spoiler. I gave a huge spoiler in that chapter. I started talking explicitly about so-called restricted teachings. Mm -hmm. I did that very mindfully because the, the, the secrecy around those teachings is what causes cult and abuse. And there's a lot of Buddhist Sanghas that have become these abusive cults. Sure. I know firsthand. And let's obliterate the secrets. You don't mm -hmm. need them, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and let's talk about that. Okay, now let's talk about education. Okay, yeah. let's talk about New York City pool halls. Okay, it's, let's talk about an underground trans community that no one ever talked about. Yeah, it, it's a journey that's very multifaceted. And that really does move into and out of a lot of different topics and categories and scenes and moments. We have a question 
Okay. Uh, that came in, Diana. Have you read The Danish Girl by David Ebershaw or seen the film? Or do you have any comments about the film or the, the book? And what are the best books about the trans community other than your own excellent memoir, of course? <laughs> well, The Danish Girl, the film was based on uh, Lily's diary. Uh, mm -hmm. So, the you know, one of the first, maybe the first trans woman to subject herself to, you know, surgery and, and died as a result. Mm -hmm. um, kept these diaries and they based the film on it. And I have seen the film. The problem with the film is that they tell it through the wife's point of view. Right. It's not the wife's diary. No. No. You know, again, leave it to um, you know, the dominant group to assume narrative control. Yeah, that's you said it, you nailed it. That's what they did. Over yeah. a minority's story. So the mm -hmm. film I found to be deeply concerning, um, you know, because of the, I mean, how you can get a wife's story out of a trans woman's diet. I mean, that is gold. Yeah. And they yeah. took it and they made it into whatever. Um, so that was my take. Uh, now, I don't recognize that byline on the Danish girls, probably somebody writing about it um, or, or novelizing it or, or something. But it was based on the diary, uh, the diaries of that trans woman that, you know, it's not good enough to have trans experience. Yeah, hopefully that changes. And I think it's starting to. Do you, do you think we're starting to see a sea change? Do you feel it? I'm writing a treatment right now of this book. Oh, wow. And I'm Can writing, you talk about that? Well, a little bit. I'm, I'm writing it <laughs> in terms of four seasons on Netflix because that's our, that's our container lately. Oh, wow. So, so I'm writing. Out. It is. Well, we'll see. I mean, who knows? I don't know if anyone's going to jump to it, but I'm writing it out in terms of the different episodes, because if I leave this again in the hands of somebody yeah. who is not trans or or maybe isn't so talented or whatever, uh, it's going to get simplified and it's going to get whitewashed or whatever the trans is going to get cis washed or, or whatever that is. You remember that horrendous Stonewall movie that was made a few years ago? They made. I'm not you know, sure. Oh What's God! Here? But yeah, you know, I mean, like, was it Marsha P. Johnson who really started? She was a black trans woman. Sure, of course. And yet, in the film, it's a gay, white, cisgendered male who starts it. Of course, it is. It's, I was just like, "Are you kidding?" Like, that's it's appalling. Do you know why? Do you know why the, the trans women start everything? Tell me. Because we have nothing to lose. We're very dangerous, and we, we we need it, Diana. We need we need dangerous radicals in these circles because I think we've gotten too soft. That's why you do <laughs> not fight us because we've got nothing, to lose. <laughs> and you do not doubt us because the only thing we have is our integrity. Yeah. We've got nothing else. Yep, you, you said it. Pain. You said it. Diana, we're at the end of our, our hour. Thank you so much for this. It was It's really been illuminating and, and, and deeply moving. The book is This Body I Wore, a memoir. Diana Getch, um, check it out. Either borrow it or buy it. I, I can't believe that was an hour, Brian. No, it blew. It's actually an hour and five. We went, we went over a little. But it was very compelling. Thank you so much, Diana. And take Thank care, you. everyone. Have a good weekend. Be well. Stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye.